усі російські активи, активи самої держави терориста та пов'язаних з нею осіб, які є в різних юрисдикціях та заморожені, мають працювати для захисту від російської ж агресії. Вони мають бути конфісковані. Я дякую кожному і кожній, хто допомагає нам просувати цей механізм відновлення справедливості. The European League Award 2023 in Human Rights goes to Jason McHugh. Presenting the award, Mr. Pablo Sunier, manager of the Professional and Business Excellence Institute. You've made me feel a bit more European, thank you. Jason McHugh is joining us now live from London and he gets a question right off the bat. How does the best European lawyer of 2023 live among the entire streets and neighborhoods of criminal Russian assets due to which the UK capital is already called London Grad, like Russian city. My country, and uh, we've woken up to this. We were beginning to wake up when Russia decided to bring poisons and kill people in our country over the last years. And, and I actually think our intelligence services had woken up to this a long time ago, but I don't think our politicians had, and I don't think the public had to some extent. They didn't understand the threat of Russia. But I think now people do. I think people are appalled at the extravagance of those Russians who swaddled around London, buying everything, throwing their parties. I think people are embarrassed. I think people want to change it, but they want to do something. What we should be doing is putting in a lot of effort and trying every avenue to use those sanctioned assets and confiscate them for Ukraine, for your war efforts now, and to help you with your rebuild and reparations. Thank you very much, Jason, for the initiative on the air from London. I hope when you say we, you mean also the mayor of British capital, who also should help Ukraine to identify and seize the Putin's criminal regime's Russian assets. Today, there's so much Russian cash in Britain, the capital has been nicknamed Londongrad. Oligarchs' money is propping up Putin's regime and helping to fund the war in Ukraine. Someone who has stolen a company in Russia, you are only rich because you're friends with Vladimir Putin. There is this nickname for Eaton Square, it's called Red Square, um, because there's so many Russians. I mean, it's a slightly ironic nickname because obviously Red Square is, you know, tends to be associated with communism. We got instructions to uh, recover 200 billion from the Russians and give it to the Ukrainians, which they deserve. Go Ukraine! Jason, some words about your last visit to Kyiv when you met with Kirill Budanov, head of the main intelligence department of Ukraine, Mikhail Podolyak, advisor to the head of the presidential office, and Taras Semkiv, the head of the department of the prosecutor general's office of Ukraine. In Kyiv, you also gave a common prominent lecture with the professor of Pittsburgh, Charles Kotubi, at the Kyiv School of Economics, and also run an organization called Payback for Ukraine, together with him and British colonel Tim Spicer. I am an ambassador for an organization called Payback uh, for Ukraine, which is, is run by a very prominent British lawyer, uh, Dr. Jason McHugh, whose sole purpose is to extract reparations for the aggression and damage done by Russia. Absolutely right. We had, it, it was a very good discussion at the Kiev uh, School of Economics. It was very good. And what we were trying to say, myself and uh, other professors there, was if we can orchestrate, and this is what Payback for Ukraine that was put together to do, Ukrainian lawyers and the Ukrainian courts and the Ukrainian government to fast track, really best practice cases and obtain judgments, successful judgments against the Russian state mm -hmm. and aspect, other aspects of it as well of the war machine in Ukrainian courts. We can then organize them to be domesticated in overseas courts. So we set up a program with the help of uh, different ministries in your government and uh, international lawyers and law schools all over the year, uh, all over the world. 
those lawyers in the world have got cases ready, a bit like the one I designed against Wagner in the UK, but in lots of different countries in Europe and in America. Cumulatively, the total of those cases comes to potentially a recovery of 200 billion US dollars. The total value of frozen Russian assets around the world is over 300 billion dollars. Yes. Frozen assets, right? Exactly. Exactly. When you talk about the value of the assets around the world, you're having a laugh when you say it's 300 billion only. 300 billion is just federal reserve stuff uh, that are sanctioned. If you're looking at the real wealth around the world, some of which is sanctioned as well, which is of the Russian war machine, and if you're looking at money which is not sanctioned but is flooding Europe, America, UK, Let's face it, what have we got in the UK? I think there's about 13, 14 billion of Russian frozen assets. It might be 17 billion, I, I forget. Um, so the cost of doing that and bringing in things, the cost of domesticizing them... And it is not so expensive as you <laughs> it wrote is, in your article. As, for example, the cost of one tank. You're, you're quite right. Price of one tank. When I began work on Putin's people a long time ago now, in 2013, Putin, in taking control of the Russian economy that had already made the transition to the market, essentially had hundreds of billions of dollars at his command and the ability to cause much more chaos. Catherine Belden, author of Putin's People, claims that this amount is more than twice as large. 600 billion dollars. Certainly those experts who wrote Putin's uh, people, fantastic book. Personally, from my point of view, I think it's a lot more. I think there's a lot more money out there. And why is there more money out there? Well, I'm sure people will concur, but the fundamental reason is this, is that these Russian oligarchs and people like Putin have stole so much money off their state. They don't trust each other, they don't trust the state, so they don't keep it in Russia because they can't trust it to be kept in Russia, so they put it abroad. And they've tried to hide it as much as they can with the help of what I think is disgusting lawyers and accountants in the rest of the world who have helped them hide it. And I think we should be looking at that and we should be looking at revealing it all. Now, the UK is under pressure to show its Western allies it can stop the flood of corrupt money. Dominic Grieve is a former conservative member of parliament who served as attorney general and chaired Britain's intelligence committee. Money has been flowing into the United Kingdom, absolutely no doubt about this, which often has had what I could only describe as a tainted source. But then Russia is a mafia state. In Switzerland, Russian assets was more than 6.8 eight billion were frozen. 6.3 billion is nothing compared to the Russian money that was in Switzerland. I said was because I'm not sure that it still remained, but it was assessed to 200 billion dollars. That money has been, has been taken for criminals that are under sanctions now. And I really hope that Switzerland, but also other countries that have frozen assets will be courageous enough to take the decision to use that money for reconstructing Ukraine. And we should look at then bringing actions to take that money in a legally justifiable way and give it to Ukraine. It's not these figures of 500 billion, 600, you're over a trillion. It's huge. It's huge. This trillion dollar gas station, that's Russia, to use a phrase that John McCain used, Ukraine is the most urgent battle on hand, and we didn't enable the Ukrainians to win decisively in terms of finance, in terms of in terms of of human life. The most important aspect is documenting the evidence as well as agreeing on investigative and prosecutorial strategy. So basically, the center is a back office in action with access to various resources within Eurojust and in The Hague. I was thinking last night, what is the biggest problem that particularly our friend here is facing? What the center should be doing is, yes, working on this tribunal, also working on the register, which is very valid and doing a great job there, but how to bring that into the damages claim and how to make the legal claim 
through this tribunal on the back for the reparations claim, which then will allow confiscation through a proper judicial assessment of damages. This is the most important task of the group of prosecutors who are doing their job with the help of their national prosecutorial offices and their national investigative authorities. And of course, work done by all of us. And this gives us an opportunity not to lose these evidences because before what happened in many cases, people, Ukrainians, go, report, give evidences, and they were, keep, they were you know, procedurally documented, but keep in file. Jason, before the previous New Year's Eve, Mentioned on your website, Payback for Ukraine, ex-UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson visited Borodyanka, a town ruined by the Russians and mined with explosive ordnance, where we, along US donors, donated 32 Quantix 4 drones to air survey all the destruction. Today, one of the drones that we are going to fly and help people who like this. 32 of these drones. Maximum wind, uh, 14. No, no, about 18. Bro. One year after that, and two years into the full-scale invasion of Ukraine, the Ukrainian government reported that it is still finalizing the state register of losses and damages and it's still developing an application form for victims and software for the register. The problem with the figures is they're not concentrating on the people's losses. They're, they're concentrating on state and civil society losses because they're much more definable. When you get into an individual family, you know, if you look at yourself and you look at your family, you could draw up a long list of all the things, you know, reduction in wages, you lost a car, you got damage to your house, you have this, that, but someone got hurt, whatever. You add those up and you evaluate them. It's a very large sum. People are talking about infrastructure, the loss to the economy and all of that. Well, what about when you add up the motorbike that the young lad lost, the baker's shop, someone who lost their father? Listen, I, I, I've, I've worked in some dreadful places which have been mined dreadfully in uh, African states during recent wars and conflicts and skirmishes. It pales into the insignificance. And I've seen the damage that's done, not just to that generation that are living after it. Yes. Who are at threat, but the generation. For next generation, generations, yes, exactly. It, it, it can move two generations readily. Demining is something that I've been concerned about from very early on in the recent invasion um, uh, because the amount of uh, ordinance that the Russians have been putting down is incredible. incredible it, it's really. huge. You cannot build anything on the mine territory, you know. Before this, you have to demine it. The whole value of this work is like for restoration and recovery of Ukraine from 400 to 700 billion dollars, the same. Who is responsible? Russia, the Russian state. So there's no question about that. Uh, they put them and they've been irresponsible and it's another act of terrorism, actually. The Russians put a mine in your garden of your house. You have the right to claim that against Russia. If it's in municipal lands, uh, you know, in a town or something like that, then the uh, the town council, the municipality, mm -hmm. has a right to bring that claim. If indeed the state has a right to bring it claim on, on a more general level. Um, there's different layers of who has claims, but they should be being brought. Mm -hmm. That there should be some model cases going in on demining. Because the hope was that if you've got the cases coming through, and this would have been a year and a half on now, so they'd be coming close to completion now. We raised this 18 months ago. 18 months ago, we established the non-governmental organization Demining Control in order to track any cent, any euro for demining of Ukraine. I'm really concerned. I'm really concerned about it. And I don't think enough thought is being given into it. I think it's very, I think the experts are there, 
both private sector and from um, the NGO world, they need to be financed absolutely fully now because it's now that they can be clearing strategic areas to create safe zones or strategic zones for the war efforts and they can build a plan for the long term. It must be the alliance like NATO of all of countries and states which are interested in demanding Ukraine. Yes. The next level, each country, each organization, each fund, Mm. They have to create common fund, yeah. financial fund. I totally understand what you mean. Um, let me give some thoughts on it. First of all, it needs to have authority, not just support of the Ukrainian government and international, but authority from them to act in a way. There's no point in just saying, oh, give us your views. Mm -hmm. These are all good ideas. You need authority. It's exactly what's got to happen. You've got to be minded of it. People don't want to throw money in because of the history of Ukraine and the stories of corruption. So you've got to put measures in. If the international donors are worried about the corruption in Ukraine, they have just to make a work office near Ukraine, for example, in Poland, as it was made with the Chernobyl disaster. Yes, yeah, that's a very, I, I totally agree. What I'm advocating is exactly what you've said has been set up. There's three stages. One is, how do you get rid of the mines in a plan? Two, what is your process for doing it, which you were just been talking about? Well, the third one is, how do you get the money for it? And the money bit from it, what I'm advocating is, yes, it's got to come from the international community, because it's in everyone's interest. But also, we should be looking at how we get it off the Russians to pay for it. And it's that last bit which no one is listening to me about, which is really frustrating because it's an obvious way of... Yes, exactly. It's obvious. Yes. Yes. Attacking Russian assets. And it, it becomes really important. You'd be able to take interim orders and get money to pay for the demining. I presume I got this award for um, the, the work we're doing in Ukraine. Go Ukraine. Your company's case against the already liquidated Evgeny Prigozhin and his Wagner Group succeeded in having this criminal formation recognized as a terrorist organization. Yes, it is important for definitions. Yes, it is important to use the terrorism in the case because that is what they've done. It really does make the case much easier in, in not just the British court, but any court in the world. Mm -hmm. because. If you prove an organization is a terrorist organization, uh, one, it doesn't have the sovereign immunities because it, it, it's effectively a mercenary terrorist organization. So you can bring your case much easier. One of the reasons we brought the Wagner action, well, there was a number of reasons. One was because Wagner was the manifestation of the terrorism that was inflicted on your country. Wagner were just dreadful. Yeah. And somebody had to stand up to them, somebody had to do something to say, this is not acceptable. Is this really the key to accusing the Putin regime of mercenary terrorists and the Kremlin's official payment from the Russian state budget? Yes, your analysis is correct. People were asking as well, ah, oh, is, is it at an end now because Prigozhin was murdered by Putin? Well, no, it's more valid now. And in fact, it's better now because when somebody takes over an organization that has committed a crime, mm -hmm. they take on the previous liabilities. Mm -hmm. So now all of a sudden we have a lot more defendants mm -hmm. we can take exactly, money on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so the case is much stronger than ever now um, through that circumstance that occurred. And we're very eager to go, as are, there's a case in America as part of the group against Wagner. They're equally excited to go. The same things happen. Does this legal algorithm make it possible to claim, for example, a $200 billion or maybe a trillion dollars in future in compensation from the Russian Federation for millions of our victims? The tactical benefits it gives Ukrainians is it, it allows the cases to be pleaded in a much more simpler way 
and it allows you to go target assets that you wouldn't otherwise be able to attach to. The American government, my own government, the European government, Ukraine government to come together because I know the rest of us practitioners know how to work with Ukrainian lawyers who, let's face it, they all want to be bringing these cases, but they need the resource to be able to do it. Fund the initiative to let us start putting these cases through European and English courts, domesticizing them. There's a whole team of lawyers and experts that we have who are saying, we think we can do this. What the disconnect is, is getting the legal brains of practitioners with the governments who have the will to do all of this, by the way, and want to hit the same objective, and then your government to understand how these things work and how it can work together and getting everyone to do it. That's it. Can we talk about international courts and political processes regarding the Russian-Ukrainian war, in particular about the decision of the International Criminal Court, which recognized uh, both Vladimir Putin and Maria Belova as criminals for this, as well as about the genocide trial in the International Court of Justice, in which an unprecedented 32 countries participated. If you take the ICC, for an example, mm -hmm. the ICC isn't a perfect model. Um, for lots of reasons. One is, what has it been doing? 20 years? 10 prosecutions? Not that good a strike rate. The other issue you've got with the ICC is what it's eventually doing is what I talked about at the beginning, and it's very important, which is the criminalization of these. It's a legacy justice issue. It's very important it's done for the future and the world altogether. Is it going to put reparations on your plate? Is it going to provide you confiscation of Russian assets now? No, it can not do it. Neither can the ICJ. It's not possible. Everyone knows that in our situation, ICC has no jurisdiction because of legal reasons. Time is of the essence in our situation. Even mentioning first arrest warrant of the ICC I told this many times publicly, five months of work. Five months of work because we prioritize this only case. We stopped all others, prioritize this case, five months. For the ICC is incredible. It's changing of culture because we, and this is the position of my, my very esteemed colleague Karim Khan, it's about delivering justice in time. Delivering justice to victims and survivors why they are still traumatized, but still alive. What I don't like is the approach of manana. Tomorrow we'll do it, it'll, it'll be ready in a few months, or, you know, we'll, we'll seek justice at the end. No, 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 no. As this war has shown, you need justice now in being able to confiscate assets. To do that, you need to do this. There must be a legally international law practice compliant route to be able to confiscate a sanctioned asset. Because if we don't have that, all decorum goes. We're, we're living in chaos. We are not naive with our aspiration to establish the special tribunal for the crime of aggression. It will take time. It will take resources and political will of the international community. I fully agree that this is completely political discussion because the, the evidences of the act of aggression are like visible, they are public. Thank you. Um, Jason, would you like to come in on this as well? We're bringing a case for some uh, Ukrainian victims against Wagner Group. And we've had material evidence from yourselves. It's brilliant. From your defense services, brilliant. From British, American governments, brilliant. But there's been a standout, and the standout has been civil society. The amount of material and evidence they've been able to throw in. And I say this is important because Nuremberg didn't have it. It's a big advantage we've got. I'd like to see that being worked into the model because it's also important on the depoliticization of it, that it's coming from organizations like that. Thank you, Toby. I, I would agree. There has to be uh, engagement with Ukrainian professionals 
Um, but it has to be something which fully embraces and incorporates um, civil society because again, as Jason has said, um, that is how you depoliticize and that is how you ensure that the process is perceived as being legitimate. How exactly do these high-profile global political and judicial processes can help Ukrainians punish Russians with money? If you're talking about international courts now, which can help Ukraine more than sticking on the wall a wanted poster saying that Putin's a nasty boy, well, I already know that. Yes, I'd like to see him with a thousand year sentence for what he deserves, but the fact of the matter is I'd rather see 300 billion come into Ukraine now for your war efforts and to help your people rebuild their lives. There is something that myself and a number of uh, academics in the UK and um, America are working on, and we think it's through the ECHR. There is a potential route of using that country if states that are hosting sanctioned assets around the world, say Belgium, say the UK, yes, yeah. who are also members of the ECHR, are joined into the action of Ukraine against Russia and are members of it under Article 48, that would give them legal justification to confiscate sanctioned assets and to, to satisfy a judgment of the ECHR in favor of Ukraine. It's a clever legal argument. It's something that can be done. It can be fast-tracked. So if you're looking at that on the international institutions that are out there, I would advocate that the ECHR route is the route to go and we are trying to uh, lobby and talk to uh, the relevant international community members at the moment to see whether this will work. I, I, I hope it does. And it needs clever thinking because you've got to do something which hasn't happened before in the world because this scenario hasn't happened. Because a very new issue, you know, we have no practice. The world has no product. It's not a traditional route. It's not, it's, it's innovative. It's something, it's very international cutting edge stuff, but it works. The only award I've received for it so far was about a month ago of President Putin. He sanctioned me. Look, this is the way I look at it. You, you, we all know what Putin's right, right? Do you think he gives a shit that someone sends him an ICC judge? No. No, exactly. Do you think you, he cares if you take 300 billion off him? He's a gangster, of course he cares. <laughs> That's what's going to change things, which creates deterrence. That's what stops the next dictator from doing it. Wars are about economics and money. They're less about politics anymore. And accountability and justice for Ukraine means reparations. Let's face it, Putin mops prosecution in the ICC, right? What he doesn't like is money being taken off him. I would not say the Tribunal for the Crime of Aggression and other elements, but reparations and reparations. The International Center for the Prosecution of the Crime of Aggression is the first but very crucial step towards the administration of justice against the supreme international crime. Of aggression. Given the chance of getting Putin, Lavrov et al. in The Hague, whether that chance is obviously very, very low. So, in effect, does that not mean that your position is actually then anti the establishment of a special tribunal? Because, in effect, you're saying without that, we should never have a special tribunal, and therefore a, tri a tribunal basically can't be established. And secondly, if there was a damages assessment added onto it, given a number of assets, or there are you know, several billion dollars worth of assets in the EU that we know are not in absentia, they're here, would that move the dial? We're not likely to get Putin before a court anytime soon. And of course, as we've spoken about the, the, the reparation, the comp compensation schemes, that is a process that, that can feed from those trials. I think bringing before the court is the ideal, but it may, may mean that in the short term, we have to focus on something which is less than ideal. Lawyers better understand than others the risks of impunity for the aggression 
committed against Ukraine. So we can't interfere, but in order to un understanding that we have the same goal, we have the same aim, and we, we need to coordinate our efforts not in order not to lose, but to win. I spent years um, bringing cases against terrorists, terrorist groups. One of the things is they never turn up. They have a choice to turn up. They don't turn up. Why don't they turn up? They don't turn up because they don't agree with the rule of law in our courts. It's the same with Russia. I'm sorry, we go through the case, we professionally do it. We allow them to have lawyers who turn up and act and argue their defense. If they don't choose to turn up, that's their problem. And I think in these cases, I think we've got to get beyond these issues and, uh, and really support it. I think it's not that way round, is the simplest way of answering that. The, the question is, give us a court, let us put the evidence, let the court decide to prove the case. So, uh, going at the moment, you're going on exactly what our friends are saying here. This is about rule of law stuff. There could not be a graver example of what the Russians have done to destroy what we've built since 45. If we care in it, and any country cares in it, this is the moment now. Provide that court, let them then prove the evidence. May I add one more argument? This story on special tribunal is about political will, courage, bravery and unity. If we do nothing else, and we've had this discussion frequently, if we, if we don't do the right thing now, think not of what this conflict is now, think of what the next conflict will become. And I think that is the important thing. If we do not take appropriate action now, international criminal justice, as we understand it, will be dead. And so I think that is why we have to take action. And I think it gets back to what Toby said, what Jason, all of us are saying, uh, that the issue here is the survival of what I think is post-World War II legal order. If, if you want to see that continue as the base of, of how we operate, then this war needs to be won and those that violated these, saying, these principles of international law need to be brought to justice. Russia and Iran moving the focus away from Ukraine onto Israel-Palestine. The sure issue which will divide the democratic uh, international community is that one issue. They, their hands and their dirty hands are behind that conflict and they've done it on purpose. Let's stick to our determination and stick together and let's be bigger and better than people like the Russians who don't give a shit about democracy or rule of world law. You know, they're terrorists. They've proved themselves to be terrorists. We will not stoop to those levels. So what the game has become now is we don't just need to get the money from the Russians, whether sanctioned or non-sanctioned assets from them, to repay Ukraine. At the end of the war, we've got to get them now for the war efforts. That's, that's, that's a different game. That's a different game. And so the world is having to look, and lots of eminent lawyers around the world, very distinguished ones from every country, are looking at this issue, trying to see how you can take those assets now, particularly those ones which are sanctioned, and confiscate them for Ukraine. But world order and rule of law demand that we find a legal route to do that. And that's very important, as you Ukrainians know, because you're not just fighting for your homeland. You're fighting for the rule of law and democracy for all exactly, of us. Yeah. We were looking at ways of trying to secure for Ukrainian people and the Ukrainian state and Ukrainian companies ways of guaranteeing that they get the compensation reparations they deserve from this Russian aggression, which was not vulnerable to politics and negotiation, real law ways of getting it. This was something we highlighted 18 months ago. That doesn't mean that it shouldn't start now. I wish it did. If you can find people who want to sit down in your government and international community and do a plan, there's plenty of experts, far better than me, who know what they're doing in this particular area. But we can put a plan together and get it actionable. This is all about working together in unity and doing plans and actioning them. This program is ready to go. There's law, lawyers, investigators, everyone's set up, ready to help you, Ukraine. We have to bring people onto the actions, but for this, 
These law firms around the world need resources. To get this done to help you in your war efforts, it needs funding from the international community. And we are waiting on that funding. We are lobbying for that funding. We are trying to do all we can to get that funding to enable those cases to be resourced and in get going. Why are we not doing it? Why are we not applying for interim orders? Why is not the government um, working together with the people bringing these cases and trying to allow interim orders and fast tracking these cases? If we work together, we can do it. What I do know as a lawyer is we're not here to say, say it's not possible. I don't think so. Oh, that'll be hard. We're there to say, a, a bit like the lads on the front line, the brave soldiers, you don't go, oh, I don't fancy it. You go for it. Give it a go. Law is about challenging in it and expanding it and using it in new ways. It is up to lawyers to be brave in those courtrooms. Thank you very much. Thank you. I hope that You're was welcome. okay. Yeah, yeah. Bye-bye. I suspect, unfortunately, Ukraine is going to go on for a long time. Uh, so we're, we're doing that. We're doing the Rohingya. Uh, trying to find reparations for the Rohingya after the genocide they suffered. We're about to start cases uh, relating to uh, Gaza. Uh, we're doing cases for victims of uh, nuclear testing at the moment. It's endless. The problem is the world is full of shit. It's awful things happening. And right now with this war that's going on, this is the rule of law under attack for all of us. And it's the time when lawyers like myself, whatever little bit we can do, we've got to stand up and fight.